Well, good morning. Um, this morning lecture, I'm going to do something here that normally I do in every single class that I ever teach. Um, regardless of whether the topic is Paul's epistles, hermeneutics, apologetics, church history, Baptist history, whatever, um, I take a couple of classes and not only give them prolegomena, which is the words before the words, but I like to give something that's foundational. I don't like the word presupposition because I don't like presuppositions. I think presuppositions get in the way. It's like trying to force your opponent to stand in a certain way. I mean, if they're the opponent, you take them as they come. Um, and I'm an evidentialist. I believe that there's more evidence to prove there is a God. And I believe that historical evidence, judicial evidence is, is there that Christianity doesn't need many presuppositions. Maybe logic as one, but that'd be about it. That somebody uses a little common sense. But after I became a Christian, um, I used to get hit with this a lot, <clears throat> especially somebody who would be curious about our background. So you were, so you were raised a Muslim, yeah, yeah, we were. Myself and my both, both my brothers, our father still Muslim, um, our sisters still Muslim, etc. And then they would say, okay, so you were Muslim, yes, and now you're a Christian, yes. When did you switch? No, I didn't switch anything. Jerseys. I went from being lost to being found. I went from worshiping a false dead idol named Allah to knowing the only true and living God. I'm not religious. But that's a profundity, especially in our culture that loves vague language. I'm not religious. As a matter of fact, I began to develop this, and I do it with college students, and I do it at church camps. Um, because on the one hand, I didn't want anybody to think, you know, we're all just sort of similar, we're all just sort of religious. On the other hand, I didn't want it to become a cliche, because, again, on the other hand, people would say, Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. And that's profound, and it's profoundly true, but <clears throat> it's not enough. I teach world religions, I teach global apologetics, and so it became profoundly important to me. It became a seminal issue that I would be able to to the best of my ability, explain and unpack why Christianity isn't a religion, why others aren't a relationship. And so, uh, for the past 25 years, I think in every class, I have at least one moment. I'll usually do one class where I talk about everybody can write a book. I absolutely believe every human being, every believer in Christ, has at least one book in them. And they can, if they will, can, if they wish, publish. Now, there are those who are called to write, but then there are those who are capable of writing, and I believe we're all capable of writing. Um, our book, your book. I also have one that I do <clears throat> on the difference between cult and cultic, which I may include in, in these series, but you can do this by going to any epistle in the New Testament. It's what I call the stuff that we gloss over, the gloss over texts. For instance, beginning of Matthew and Luke, all those begats, you know, we have a tendency to gloss over those. Um, it sounds like Leviticus almost too much. You know, it sounds too um, uh, big name oriented, and so we ignore it. Uh, but every one of the epistles seems to have at the beginning and most of them at the end a, uh, a similar approach, regardless of the book, whether it's by Peter or Paul, James, Jude, etc., um, or Apostle John, they all seem to have the same similar approach, which is, I, Steve, write unto you Bob, and all of the churches who are there in Alabama, grace, mercy, and peace to you. Mercy, grace, and peace to you. Grace and per mercy, mercy and grace, and blah, blah, blah. in the name of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and then it goes on and unpacks it. It sounds like the beginning of a letter, which is exactly what it is. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it's exactly what that is. It's, a, it's the beginning of the letter. But I would submit to you that what we're glossing over, that sounds so similar, number one, there's a reason it's similar, and number two, there's a reason you shouldn't gloss over it. It's because in a very short, compact manner, 
the apostle, whether it's Paul or Peter, or any of them, is telling us the defining characteristics of Christianity that separate it from any other system in the world. If you've got the notes in front of you, the prolegomena apologetics notes, then this is page two, and you can fill in the blank. If you don't, feel free to just make your own chart. Um, I refer to this as six degrees of separation because these are six points that I make that separate Christianity from every other religion. By the way, there's more than just these six, but, but these six are simple. They're simple. And I've often said, if you can give me 15 minutes, I can uh, hopefully unpack it for you. So you take any book in the New Testament, any one of the epistles. I am just going right here. Here's 1 John, beginning in verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled, of the word of God, of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was, from, which was with the Father, was manifest unto us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare unto you, that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father, with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things have I written unto you, that you, your joy may be full. Now, that's just one of them. There's more verses you go through as it happens, but that's just one of them. That's just one of the examples. There are implicit in every one of these unpacked in those verses. Sometimes you have to read a little bit further to verse 6 or verse 8 or verse 9, but you're always going to see the same common components. You could do this in a college group. You can do this in a Sunday school class. You can, you can unpack this any way you wish. It's yours. Feel free. But when you bring me in to do it, what you're doing is you're unpacking and revealing Christianity is fundamentally not a religion. It's a worldview, to be sure. Philosophy, sure. But not a religion. A religion is a set of rules and rituals and rites that people follow to either get their God or gods to love them or to get them to quit hating. And Christianity is the exact opposite of that. Everything Jesus Christ did defied that definition. Of the 7.8 billion people on the planet, a couple of years we're going to be at 8 billion people on the planet. Everybody's religious. Even people who don't believe in a God are superstitious. And what do they do? They do what they do, they say what they say, they wear what they wear. To get good blessing or to stop bad curse. Everybody's religious. Everybody believes that there's some power outside of themselves that can influence their life. And everything Jesus Christ did in, inverts that. The first difference, number one, every other religion on the planet has a God who is either angry, on a throne, or uninterested. They have a tendency to picture God like an old man holding a lightning bolt, sitting on a throne waiting to just destroy them. So he's either angry, uninterested, or not there. I mean, Hinduism has almost a third of a billion gods under the you know titles of Vishnu, Shiva, Brahman. But Buddhists, they actually didn't have a god. Buddha didn't believe in a god until he died, and then they made him a god. Every other religion has a god who is either uninterested, doing what he does, we're not there. Only Christianity has a father. And you'll note in every one of these epistles, God our Father. Well, what's that mean? It's the offer of intimacy. Every other religion has a God who's uninterested or gods that don't care. Only Christianity offers you a relationship whereby the guardian of the galaxies, the, the creator of the universe, the cosmos, enters into a relationship with you whereby he's father and you're his child. That intimacy is a massive difference. If you're if you raised in church, this, this is lost on you, but there's no such thing as accepting Lao Tzu into your heart. There's no such thing as a Confucius uh, 
praying in the Analects and all of a sudden accepting God. I mean, the Analects only mentions heaven once. It doesn't even mention the name of a God. <clears throat> they don't have a relationship that they offer. They don't offer an intimacy. See, in Christianity, God doesn't just offer you forgiveness, doesn't just give you heaven. Those are awesome. And yes, you are forgiven. And yes, if you are saved, then you do have heaven as your home. But the moment you become a Christian, you become a child of God, not just a creation of God. And so God our Father that intimacy is both by prayer. I mean, the psalmist says God inclines his ear to hear the prayers of his saints. Uh, that is massive. There's no such thing as a Muslim praying prayers to get the attention, to, in, to intercede. Because Allah is going to do what Allah is going to do. You fall down, you bust your neck, and inshallah, Allah wills it. Number two. In every other religion, they've got great teachers gurus, guides, and they always point you to, they always point you to a system. Only in Christianity is there a savior. Jesus didn't point them to a system, he pointed them to himself. Now here's something you can say on a Sunday to shock your people, or you say it in a Sunday school class, or you say it to the students. Yeah, so today's Monday. <clears throat> I got harsh news for you to hear on this Monday. Jesus is not offering you forgiveness. Not today. He's not offering you life. He's not offering you hope. Jesus isn't going to give you joy. Then you pause. Instead, what I'm actually telling you is he's offering you himself. Christ is your peace. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's not saying I'm going to give it to you. He says, I'm giving you myself. What he did was offer himself. And in so doing, Christianity is, is Christocentric and Christomorphic. Those two terms mean this. Number one, we're not offering them a denomination. We're not offering them a church. Don't ever take the bait. Don't escalate. Don't, don't accept that somebody is saying, well, you have, to, you have to go to this church, blah, blah, blah. Or, or, well, you guys who go to that church, you guys are evil. Well, they may be. What's that got to do with your soul? What's that got to do with Jesus? See, what I want to offer you, what I, what I want you to know is that Christ died for the world. And since he died for the world, he's offering you himself. He's offering you. That's why it says, God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Christocentric. Christianity is about being more like Jesus. As a matter of fact, when Christianity is reduced to religion, it becomes legalism. You've got to follow these rules. I believe in holiness. I hate legalism. Holiness is about looking more like Jesus. Legalism is looking more like the guy who's talking to you. Legalists always define holiness by themselves. You gotta look like me, talk like me, walk like me, smell like me, or you're not like me. Number three, every other religion on the planet understands mercy, but they don't understand grace. And if you've been in church any length of time, you have a tendency to see these things as interchangeable. That, well, I mean, mercy, grace, and peace, grace, mercy, and peace, whatever. It's all the same. No, no. Mercy is the exact opposite of grace. Grace is the exact opposite of mercy. See, mercy is when I don't get what I should get. Grace is when I receive something I shouldn't get. Mercy is when I don't get what I do deserve. It's why they throw virgins in volcanoes. It's why they do their dances to get the rain. They, they do what they do so that they don't get the storm or they don't get the tsunami or whatever. Mercy is when I don't get what I do deserve. But grace, grace is hard because grace is when I receive something I don't deserve. Why would he die for me? What have I done to earn that? It brings, brings us to number four. Every other religion on the planet, you got to follow these steps, usually going up, but you got to follow these steps to be accepted in. You do these things, and if you do them right, at some point you will become worthy of membership. Uh, if you're a follower of the Sikh religion, S-I-K-H, they have the five Ks, the knife, the comb, etc. And you have to follow those implicitly. Judaism, modern Judaism, has 613 
Commandments. We collected in the Middle Ages to see how many in what we call the Old Testament, the Law, the Prophet, and the Writings, the Prophets and the Writings, how, how many actual things do we have to follow? Because if Judaism was based on all the all of the offerings, when you don't have a temple to offer them in, how, how do you know whether you're good or not? Every one of them has rules. Every single religion. In Islam, it's Shahada, but it's five pillars as well. But only in Christianity do you have to admit you can't before you're allowed in. Every other religion, you got to be good enough to get in. Only in Christianity, you got to admit you can't to be let in. As a matter of fact, if you think you can, you're not ready. Right? Isn't that what the Apostle Paul said? If I could have been saved by following the law, I, I would have been. I tried real hard. You see, Christianity is fundamentally based on repentance. Throwing yourself on the mercy of the... People often argue about, well, is repentance a work? No. Repentance is the end of work. It's the antithesis to work. It's, it's surrender. It's when I quit trying. When I say, I can't, you got it, he does. Number five, every other religion demands that you die for your gods. But only in Christianity does God die for man. Now, somebody will say, well, but what about in the Old Testament? <clears throat> say, kill this group and kill that group. Yeah, sure. God forbears his, his judgment until they finally cross the line. I get that. But what about now? Well, well here is what about now. The last warfare that the Bible speaks about in real time, the last violence that the Bible speaks about, was the cosmic violence of the crucifixion. God died for us. And because of that, <clears throat> we're not called to kill in the name of Jesus. The, the, the vast, massive change is in fact that we're not even supposed to have enemies. The massive change is that, yeah, I'm supposed to love my enemies. We're measured by that. They'll know we are Christians by our love. That's a massive difference. Men die for gods versus God dying for man. The last difference is something I offer up for those of you who are musically inclined. It's hard for guys like me uh, who are not. <laughs> I love music. I just don't understand it all. But it's the difference between singing and worship. Every other religion, if it does involve singing and dancing, they do what they do to get the attention of their god or gods and to get something from them. But worldwide, this was, a, this was a massive, massive effect on my life. Christians worship. Singing, dancing, backflipping, whatever we do, here's the difference. Whether we're singing, dancing, backflipping, doing the first verse, the third verse, or whatever, we don't do it to get something. We do it because we've already received. Christianity's worship is based on gratitude, not blessing. We do what we do, we receive what we receive, and then we are grateful because of it. That's why worship is not to get anything. If anybody was doing a backflip sing and saying, all right, Lord, give me a Cadillac, that's not worship. Worship is based scripturally. It's based on what I've already gotten. And that's just a massive difference. I'm not religious. I have, however, entered into a relationship with the living Lord, based on the sacrifice of the Son, God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who offered himself for us, mercy and grace. He saved us, and he saved us in spite of us. That's why I worship. In the six degrees of separation, I, I would invite you to write down those six degrees and email them to me. That'll be a test and a proof that you, uh, you actually listen to the end. And the bonus is, if you could tell me what the last one is, the sixth degree of separation. Hope this, uh, hope this is of use to you. You can use it anywhere you want. Godspeed.